our guest on today's episode is Dr. Giskin Day. Giskin, welcome to In Conversation. It's great to have you on the podcast. Um, welcome, and can I just briefly ask you to tell us a bit about yourself and what your role is within the healthcare profession? Thank you. It's a delight to be here. So I've been teaching at Imperial College for about 25 years now, I think. I started by studying science communication there, and I stayed on to teach in that role. But about 15 years ago, I was invited to develop a course in medical humanities. And I now uh, lead an intercalated BSc for medical students in uh, humanities, philosophy and law. So I see myself primarily as an educationalist, but um, because I've had so much contact with, with medical students, I've taken a deep interest in what motivates them. And I, well, somewhat biasly, I, I feel that students that choose to do medical humanities would make very good doctors. Um, and I've been a bit worried about uh, levels of motivation, the levels of uncertainty around what entering the healthcare profession actually means. So I, I've been motivated to try and inspire medical students to to stick with it and give them some tools to do that. And uh, I always said that when my children left home, I would like to do a PhD. So that is what I did. So embarked on that in middle age it was a very rewarding experience. And uh, my chosen topic was gratitude in healthcare. So although I'm not a clinician, I've got a deep and abiding interest in healthcare and helping students to flourish. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And that leads on nicely to the my first question, really, or the first topic I wanted to discuss, um, because I've been quite fascinated by the whole thesis. So I did want to begin by asking you about, about it. And um, let's begin with the title. So Gratitude in Healthcare, an Interdisciplinary Inquiry. Fascinating stuff. And I can see how that relates to some of these topics that we encounter in the medical humanities. And of course, with, with um, some of the other topics that we've discussed on the preceding podcasts to this episode. But I wanted to ask you, how did you come to work on this notion of gratitude? And so what were your aims when you embarked on the thesis? And did your findings surprise you? Well, the study turned out to be very different to what I originally envisaged because a year into my PhD, a COVID struck <laughs> and uh, all my plans for making observations in hospitals went out the window. So it did turn out I had to completely pivot my study. And actually what I, I read in uh, Jensen Rue's wonderful book, uh, on The Fighting for the Soul of General Practice, I encountered myself in notions of, of bureaucracy that, that impede intellectual inquiry uh, because it took me over a year to get ethics permission to, to undertake um, very benign observations on a hospital ward um, with numerous uh, kind of obstacles to what I felt was common sense and um, actually a quite unethical way of looking at how one relates to uh, scholarship uh, around studying the behaviors of people in, in hospital. So I had a very frustrating time initially, both applying for ethics, uh, eventually getting it, and then finding out that I wouldn't be able to follow through on that after all. Mm -hmm. So the interdisciplinary inquiry is really a catch-all for having to then undertake a number of discrete studies and then try and make them work together as a whole. So, um, but I think interdisciplinarity is where it's at, right? Uh, yeah. We uh, flourish in the, the, the liminality of those, uh, those boundary spaces between quantitative and qualitative and the humanities and the sciences. Uh, and that's where I think the really interesting stuff is. Did the findings surprise me? I, I think that it turned out to be a lot more complex than I thought. I, I thought I was going to embrace certainly some disciplines uh, um, that, that just seemed right. For example, positive psychology, it seems the place to go for gratitude, right? Uh, but I actually was very disappointed with uh, the, the scholarship in, the, in that discipline. 
I just felt quite a lot of it came across as, as gaslighting. And COVID brought to the fore the fact that uh, you can't just tell people that are stressed and overworked and working in unsafe conditions to to go and uh, be more positive about their situation. Um, so I did have to reconsider some of my initial preconceptions around um, gratitude as a as a wholly positive uh, kind of social uh, performance, really, or an, ena an enactment is perhaps a better word. Uh, so it was a lot more nuanced than I thought. Um, and I think that uh, it's multifaceted both theoretically and, and practically. So they, they know easy answers, but I also did not want to end up with just saying, well, it's more complicated than we thought, you know, that's a starting point. That shouldn't be your end point. So I uh, wrestled with, with how to come out with something more to say than just, oh, well, it's complicated. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. Um, well, I guess just kind of a simple question, really, but, but what, what's the place of gratitude in the healthcare ecosystem? If you could maybe lead on from what you've just said, why is it, why is gratitude important? And how is it important and how is it functioning currently, you know, as a, as a kind of, as a, as a function of the healthcare system? Well, I think that healthcare is really interesting in that respect because unlike other acts of generosity that we perform in everyday life, there is very rarely the possibility of reciprocation when it comes to healthcare. We can't, if somebody performs surgery on us, we can't offer to do the same for them one day. It's not like a, a small favors that we exchange in everyday life. So uh, there is a, uh, that, that kind of takes that out of the equa equation. But people are profoundly grateful for healthcare. And it's a bit of a paradox, really, because it's not like other service professions. And healthcare is a service. So why should we feel gratitude or perform gratitude for something to which we're absolutely entitled? Um, especially where we, we have this system of the NHS where we all contribute to it. So it's not like we're getting treatment for free or anything like that. But um, I, I, I think it is really important. It, it, it's really important for people to be able to say thank you. Uh, they do feel very grateful. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of ambivalence around it in healthcare. And often when I talk to doctors, they say to me, well, you know, uh, I don't, I'm just doing my job. Why, you don't, I don't feel that people shouldn't thank me. Uh, but, but that's actually not true. That's usually not, not true of why people are, are expressing thanks. And they're not thanking for just doing your job. And if we took the time to listen to that feedback that people are giving when they, they express their thanks, it's uh, very useful for informing what we're doing right. So much of healthcare is set up for complaining, right? Uh, you walk into any hospital and it doesn't feel like a, a hospitable environment for gratitude. It feels it's very set up with for, for complaining. Um, so I think gratitude is uh, occupies an ambivalent position in healthcare. Uh, of course, during COVID, we had clap for carers, which turned out to be such an interesting case study, both in giving gratitude and, and then how it became almost complicit in uh, injustice, in care mm -hmm. injustice, uh, when um, it just seems totally hypocritical to be standing on our doorsteps and politicians to be standing on their doorsteps uh, and applauding a, a service for which they are not providing safe conditions. So uh, that, that highlights all the ambiguities around it, really. So I think it is it's complex and, and nuanced, but the relational nature of, of gratitude is absolutely key. People need to say thank you. And I think that it's, I've come to believe that it's part of a duty of care on the, the behalf of healthcare providers to, to attempt to accept that gracefully because sometimes people need to say it more than uh, you need to hear it. 
Thank you very much, Giskin. Again, another fascinating response. Um, I'm very lucky to, to say that we're joined again today by our frequent collaborators and the authors of Intellects Fighting for the Soul of General Practice. So I have Drs. Rupal Shah and Jens Paul on the line. Um, I'm just going to bring them in here so that we can, um, yeah, I know that they really want to engage and ask you a couple of questions. Um, and of course, they're both practicing clinicians as well. So, um, Ru, can I perhaps bring you in first here? I think I know that you've probably got something you want to, burning question you want to you ask. No, I think that Giskin's research is fascinating. I, I'm really aware that when I started as a GP uh, and people said, thank you, I would just say something very similar to what you were indicating, Giskin. Like, oh, it's just my job. I haven't done anything. And I'd kind of close it off. And then I think... I was speaking to an American friend, actually, you said something like, well, why do British people do this? You know, it's it's weird. Why can't you just accept it, accept the gratitude? And that kind of, that, I, I was really surprised to hear her say that. And so I started to kind of um, behave different, respond differently when people said thank you. And when it felt meaningful, I, I kind of um, let something happen bet between us in a way I, I kind of um say you know that that means a lot to me you know thank you very much and and then there's a kind of moment of connection which my impression is it's really important I mean it's important to me just as much as you know whatever the patient might feel grateful for it it um it really matters and I've sort of started to let it matter but I mean, from a patient's perspective, that makes a lot of sense to me because it's one of the things that makes the connection humanizes it, isn't it? When you're when you're able to accept the, the gratitude of someone who you've helped, um, and when I've had those interactions with with healthcare professionals, both here in the US and of course previously, and the National Health Service in the UK, um, I think it really makes the whole situation um, much more pleasant as a patient as well. When when you're having that human interaction with someone around this notion of gratitude. Um, Jens, what's your take on all of this? My take is questioning work to rule. On, on one hand, work to rule should be absolutely fine, good enough. You do what you have been paid for. You go, do your job, go home, life goes on. But we see at the same time at the moment, work to rule is by the BMA or the GP profession as something close to being on strike or industrial action, which is bizarre from a um, psychotherapeutic point of view. You say being good enough is absolutely good enough. You don't need to be perfect. You don't need to exert yourself. Um, as a parent, you should be good enough, end of. But on the other hand, there's this extra bit and... Um, going the extra mile, delivering the extra smile, um, being invested, um, being more imaginative, fi finding something in this case which makes me as a carer um, interested in doing all this. And there's something in it that is of intrinsic value. And it's also more fun, but it's difficult to quantify. It's difficult to ask for. Um, but I think it often is very per, very clear in the interaction, in the relationship with patients. And I can say I do it as a patient when I see somebody is actually present as a person rather than doing the your um, robot interactional transactional stuff. And I want to signal I'm aware of it. I'm grateful. Thank you. Do is is healthcare special? Possibly yes, or possibly every time when you are vulnerable, and people do something that is more than they are expected to do, even if they are paramedics, police people, blue light people, teachers. But there is a difference. You can invest more or less. You can treat people as a puppet or as a parcel. Systems are designed to be parcel force but they would not work if everybody would be in parcel force mode. I just had an experience of this as a patient um, or mother of a patient recently. And, um, you know, it was so a problem of regarding my daughter and uh, seeing 
this consultant um, who actually taught me at medical school. And he was kind and he made me, you know, he made a difficult situation better. And I, I, it felt really important for me um, that he understood I was grateful. That So it was interesting to kind of experience it from the other point of view as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that um, uh, that absolutely that notion of needing to say thank you, and and I think it's possibly not just for the service received at that point, but for so much more. There's nobody, I think, that that's unaware of the pressures of the of the healthcare system and how just turning up for work sometimes feels like. Um, having overcome quite a lot and that conditions are not good and there's a lot of pressure. So I certainly feel that when uh, having ex experienced healthcare myself, there's uh, often that uh, that feeling that you, you're thanking for more than just w what's happened. And, and often I'm aware that there's a whole team uh, behind uh, the, the care that I've received and that there are a lot of unsung heroes that work on the, the back end of things uh, and aren't patient facing. So one of the things that we really ought to be focusing on is how we make gratitude flow so that when someone in the front line, uh, oh, that's a terrible word, the patient facing uh, healthcare professionals are, are thanked that there's some way that it cascades to people that that aren't lucky enough to to be on the receiving face of that and i feel that in education as well a lot of my self-worth comes from the gratitude of students but i can't deliver it on my own so the administrators technicians professional services people working in registry how do we bring them into that that kind of magic circle where we can allow gratitude to to activate a, a positive sense of connectedness. So to do gratitude well, we need to look at ways of cascading it, I feel. It's a bit like giving tip then in a restaurant and making sure that the dishwasher and the backroom staff and they're all included and not just the waiter. Yes, exactly. And we do have to think that uh, well, it, it bothers me quite a lot that that paramedics, for example, do such important work, but are very rarely, um, well, I, I think that the levels of, of burnout and, and even suicide are, are incredibly high in that profession. Um, and so often pe patients and families are in such a traumatized position when they need the help of paramedics that it's quite difficult to track who has treated you and who should be receiving the thanks. So I think uh, patient advocacy groups, health services, and so on, uh, Care Opinion, for example, wonderful website where people can thank the people that have treated them, can, of course, also raise issues there. But uh, they go the extra mile in trying to work out, uh, on trying to connect the, the thanksgiving with to the person who, uh, for whom that thanks is, or the team for whom that thanks is intended. I think that's important. Uh, but of course, we all know that no amount of thanks offsets distressing complaint or something that uh, it's not an equation, right? Uh, you you can have um, a patient that that really uh, can behave very badly towards a healthcare professional and uh, or put in an unwarranted complaint. That is not going to be offset by. 10, 20, 30 thank you cards received over the course of a year. It's, it's not a zero-sum game. Um, and I think also thanks does not compensate in any way for unsafe, unhappy working conditions. So we can't use it to, uh, to try and paper over the cracks, as it were. And many uh, people in power when they have something bad to tell you, well, first, thank you, right? Uh, during COVID, every single government announcement was preceded by, by thanking to the NHS. 
Well, that's not going to cut it if you're using that as an excuse for not, or, or to somehow mask the fact that that you're not that you're not acting in the way you should. So gratitude cannot must be accountable. It must be accountable. You cannot use it as a way of getting yourself out of an uncomfortable situation. Thank you, Jessica. And, um, I've got one more question for you, but before I ask that question, um, Ru or Jens, did either of you have anything you wanted to ask Giskin about that response there? No, it's sort of tangentially related to what Giskin was saying, but I wonder whether the reason why um, a lot of doctors are reluctant to kind of um, accept gratitude in that connected way that I was talking about before is um, because they're worried that there's uh, that it kind of open it changes the nature of the relationship and sort of means that from now on perhaps um, they've got more of a duty that the kind of covenant the nature of the relationship has changed by that gratitude and so I wonder if it kind of makes people feel a bit defensive um, as in you know a, a bit like not wanting to accept presence uh, because it obligates you well, of course, there's a there's something in it. Of course, it changes my relationship. And um, as a practice, you have to have a gift policy. You have to declare everything. Um, it sometimes even ridiculous with the in the nursing home who nursed my mum when she died. We wanted to express the, the our gratitude, and they said, "No, no, um, we can't give no no sweets, no money." No, nothing. And I said, well, I want to give you my gratitude. You were amazing with my mom. You didn't have to do all this. You have done more. How can I give you that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> can I give you a hug? No. Are you crazy? <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, I can uh, see how difficult things can, can be. And I guess uh, part of it is about... Um, being a good part of being a good patient is knowing when the time is is right to to express gratitude uh, so that it doesn't come across as a bribe um, but so much of and, and, and I can see how doctors can get defensive as well or all healthcare professionals not just doctors because um, because it's a real act of intimacy isn't it to both give and receive gratitude yes. when it's not yes. just for fun kids and it's not yes. holding open the door, whatever, those kind of politeness routines in which thanks is so routinely ushered in. Um, but I can almost guarantee that some of your most memorable patients will be both the ones that were did not express gratitude and yes. came across as being ungrateful. Um, uh, those are very memorable. But the other ones are the ones that you were not expecting to be grateful. And I think there's some lovely passages in the book where uh, uh in your book where you explain how you've ha you've had to sometimes deprive people of their liberty or make difficult decisions about their treatment uh and then when they are are grateful after the event that 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 kind of s sticks in the mind doesn't it and same with students right <laughs> i remember students that uh, uh that were actually uh, gave us quite a hard time in the course but those are the once his gratitude is then memorable <laughs> because uh, there's the surprise value of it. Uh, but all of those we can make room for in our hearts uh, and, and encourage. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, there's a line in your book where you say that um, relational care brings the joy of human connection to work. It allows oneself to become part of someone else's story and might actually help clinicians to flourish. That's so true. And I think uh, gratitude can do that. It's that human connection. Yeah, no, I, I think the, when I wrote that, that was really on the back of, um, I hadn't even uh, thought of gratitude as a separate entity, but it's, that's why I'm so interested in what you're saying, Giskin. It, it, it is a, it's very intimate and it um, does something to the clinician as well. Yeah. Definitely. You've uh, prefigured my last question, really, Giskin. I was going to ask, as you've recently um, read Fight for the Soul of General Practice, I just wanted to ask you, what were your thoughts and how does it engage with your own work and, and your own practice? Um, I think so much of it resonated. Um, 
I think that uh, that so much of it is so human, isn't it? And and the good practice that uh, that uh, Ru and and Jens uh, put forward there, in spite of the obstacles, uh, just reminds us that the true nature of care, really, and what it means to care. And so often care is treated like a four-letter word and that it's become bureaucratized and algorithmatized and so on. Um, but but the stories that they bring uh, to their, uh, their their argument, really, um, so much of it is about connection. It's about uh, stepping away from all the, the obstacles, the checklist uh, culture, and just reminding us that, that emotion is made in in interaction um, and all of that positivity um, and negativity actually so much of it happens in conversation so emotions are not kind of only private that that sit within us um, they, they're actually made in interaction and gratitude I think is uh, is exemplary of that it it's all very well to sit and make a, a you know a, a gratitude list uh, and and hope that that's going to improve your outlook on life. But what really matters is when you express that gratitude to someone else and you you set up that human connection, you allow that emotion to flourish in interaction. Um, and a lot of the the book uh, and and the approach in the book kind of reminds me of that. And as GP practice is now under huge pressure with um, working to rule coming in, we it's a reminder that GPs are on our side really and the reason that they might be taking this action is in the interest of patients it's not a selfish action it is because things have just got too gone too far uh, and and become disconnected from the soul that Jens and Ruth speak so eloquently about so uh, and I think many patients feel that way too well, Giskin, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's been really wonderful to to have you on the podcast and thank you for those wonderful contributions. Before um, we say goodbye, I just wanted to give uh, Jens and Ru just one uh, final opportunity. Is there a, any anything you would like to to ask or, or say to Giskin before she leaves us today? From me, just thank you so much, Giskin. I'm very grateful. For me, the same. I express my gratitude for your <laughs> work on gratitude. <laughs> well, thank you to to you all too. Um, I think we've had a, a mutual gratitude pooling here. Um, but uh, I'm very grateful to, to be asked on your podcast and grateful to you for having written the book and for uh, all the good work that, that you've done on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.